Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Okay, if I need you, I'll, uh, yeah. First of all, uh, Joe, just happy 70th. It's a pleasure to be speaking on that occasion. I have to say, uh, Joe is one of my most valued colleagues in larger Cornell, the intellectual breadth, and also I feel just a sincere, sincere commitment to research and a better world for me. I relate very easily, so it's been a pleasure over the years. We've spent lots of time talking, never quite got to writing up a paper, but we've been on the verge of doing that several times. Thank you very much, Joe, for having been my colleague. I also want to, before I get in, uh, say that um, the kind of um, th theoretical research that Joe does and a couple of other uh, um, uh, people do over here, I do believe it's a very important time for the world for that kind of research. You know, normal economics, where you're looking for regularities, causality, going out and studying is extremely important. You want to do that. But with the changing nature of the world, it is time to think a bit outside of the box. And for that, abstract thinking, I do believe, is important. And I will come back and touch on that. Yesterday, when I was listening to some of your uh, talks, especially Moshe Vardi's talk, I decided that I'm going to veer away from what I had told uh, Raphael when he first asked me to speak about what I will talk about. Well, I won't renege on the contract altogether, so I will talk on corruption control and cronyism, which is what I had told him, but I've now added the and more because I want to do spend to a couple of very speculative uh, thoughts, which I want to present over here. In fact, to sort of get you all to think about it. Some of those may be wrong. It's, it's early thought, but I, I felt it's an occasion where I can share that. I, I, I told myself that I know um, Joe well enough, and now I see David Easley here. I know them well enough that I can make a fool of myself with those kinds of comments. And others I know so little that, again, I can make a fool of myself by those comments. So I'm going to get into that. But let me begin with what I said I'm going to be presenting on, where I've got a tiny paper, actually finished paper, very recently finished which looks into a very, very practical problem of corruption and cronyism. But corruption in general is a topic I got very interested in during my four years of um, doing, uh, three years of doing policy advice, which I did in India. It got me into it because I was working with a couple of people, not everybody in government, who were very sincere about it. And then you realize that corruption control, part of it is, of course, you need grit, grit and determination, but a huge amount of it is design. Because controlling corruption is almost like surgery. You're trying to take out some faulty tissues out, but you don't want to damage healthy tissues around. So a blunt instrument can be very damaging. It got me very interested. And subsequently, I've come back and I've been doing some work on law and economics, which is related to, to the corruption that I got interested in. Now, let me tell you how I got into it, uh, corruption. This was uh, rather soon after joining the government. So I used to be department chair over here. I go back, I join. Uh, there are meetings on corruption, bribery, et cetera, and what can be done. When an idea struck me, which I felt excited about in a rather narrow academic way. This was the problem. Bribery is fairly widespread in India. You won't feel it if you've gone from outside as a tourist, but if you, there are some countries where you will feel that. In India, you won't feel that. But if you're living there, filing your income tax returns, trying to pay tax, getting a driving license. I remember in, when I was in my uh, late teens, trying to get a driving license, you drive perfectly. After that, you're told you have to give a little bit of money in order to get the license. Those kinds of bribery are quite rampant. I use the term for it, harassment bribe. Though the logic applies to all kinds of bribe, harassment bribe is where you're being asked to pay a bribe for an act which is not illegal, like have to pay a bribe before you get your driving license after you've passed the test. That's a harassment bribe and lots of examples. Income tax, typically you file your tax return, do it properly, you're asked to pay a bribe before it is cleared by the officer who has to clear it. Even big deals. You are a tra big business person bringing in consignment of go uh, goods from abroad. You're stopped. You've followed all the rules, but the rules are so complicated. The officer says, unless you give me a big sum of money, I would clear your goods. 
these are all harassment bribes, nothing illegal. What struck me was in India, very few of these bribes would come up in court, cases of bribery. You feel infuriated when you're asked for a bribe like this. They don't come up in court. When they come up in court, very seldom does someone get punished. And sitting in the government with others, I, it was easy access. I sort of read up the laws. And India has a Prevention of Corruption Act, 1988. Prevention of Corruption Act, 1988 has a provision. It's a very easy uh, piece of legislation to read. It says in the event of a bribery, the giver of a bribe and the taker of a bribe are both equally punishable. It's uh, from, I forget now, one year to five years in jail. You can immediately, there are some exception clauses, but the exceptions are really only for journalists who with prior permission are doing a sting operation and giving a bribe, they won't be arrested for that. But apart from that, no matter how angry you feel at the time when you're asked to pay a bribe, once you've paid a bribe, in the eyes of the law, you're as punishable as the awful bureaucrat who took the bribe from you. It struck me that what is happening is very easy to see. After you've given a bribe, in the next stage of the game, you want to collude with the person who took the bribe from you. It's in your joint interest to hide this. Think of this as a two-stage game. It's sub-game perfect. The equilibrium is you give a bribe, and after that you collude about the fact that you've given a bribe. No one will ever know. And no surprise that bribes don't come up enough in court. People don't say, I had to pay a bribe. They'll tell friends. It's infuriating, but never stand up in court and say that. So I thought it's a clever idea. I was the chief economist. I would write up a short note. I wrote that up saying that the law ought to be changed by making the punishment asymmetric. The giver of the bribe should be allowed to go scot-free, but the taker of the bribe should be punished, maybe double up the punishment. But giving of bribe is a legitimate activity. You're allowed to do that. Taking of bribe, you're not allowed. Make it asymmetric and the equilibrium will go the equilibrium which is causing it. Very naive, I had just gone from being a professor and this only for, I said it only for legal activities very clearly. I wanted to win over the good politicians, but the logic of course applies to all. If you've given it, you don't want to promote that, but it applies everywhere, but I was doing it only for harassment bribes. Very clearly the paper has that in the headline. I, the Ministry of Finance's economics website, I was the person who was the final sort of person who has to sign off when anything is posted. So very easy to post my own paper. So I wrote this and I was careful enough. The word subgame perfection is tucked away in a footnote because I did want to catch the attention of good politicians and policymakers. Posted that and I had never been in a crisis of that kind, political crisis, because there were people writing to the prime minister saying I should be asked to immediately be kicked out of the country, certainly advisory role, because I'm saying bribe giving is a good thing. Gradually it became. So it was, I was caught in that. Subsequently, I've come back, I've done some re research on this line, but that is not, the research on this is very easy. You can see the argument is very easy to two period game. Uh, you've given a bribe, whether you should declare it or not, and you can work it out. But something else got me interested, and when Raphael wrote, I thought that that recent interest is what I'm going to present to you about. Yeah. So what is the outcome? Oh, the outcome, unfortunately, um, there's a lot of detailed thing. Um, I, with the Indian Prime Minister at that time, Manmohan Singh, who's actually a great mind and a person of fastidious personal integrity, he um, uh, told me that he disagreed with me. And I said that you haven't read my paper. You're reading newspaper reports and disagreeing with me. But then he told me something which was very heartening, saying that though I disagree with you, your purpose as an advisor is to bring ideas to the table. So feel free to talk about it. I talked. Nothing happened out of it. There was one industrialist who supported me in an article who happened to be a trustee of Cornell, and Nara and Murti, some of you will know wrote and supported. There were international uh, economists wrote a page supporting the idea. Uh, Lamond had a piece, but in India it was dreadful and no change took place on that. Pardon? <laughs> I, have, uh, 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 
I, did I have to bribe some of them? Unfortunately, not in this. You know, one of the things about bribery you realize going into government, which was very clear to me, is in everyday life where you are asked for a bribe. Once you're in a senior, a senior post in government, those officers know bureaucrats. They don't ask you for a bribe. So once you're there, you're sheltered, which was for me very infuriating because the previous year I would be asked and then it was all looking clean then onwards. Okay, let me jump to what I want to present to you here is something that struck me about, again, about corruption and cronyism. Leaders typically come to power, a whole lot of them, with the agenda that I want to cut down corruption. In countries with a lot of corruption, you come, well, part of it is, of course, political, because people fret about corruption, that you realize that, uh, especially when you're in government, that that's a focal point of countries with a lot of corruption. So it's a good political platform. But there are leaders where one believes that their initial plan was to curb corruption. They came to power. After they come to power with that promise that they will curb corruption, there are ways in which they can stick to that promise, which, however, can be damaging for the economy. And in a roundabout way, could ultimately lead to greater corruption. Xi Jinping, there are many things about him, but when he first came to power, there was a lot of statements from him, how he's going to control corruption, but which way did it go? What I've got here is a tiny model, two pages of PowerPoint, and I can explain that to you. Okay. Yeah, he, there was some actions, but Pardon? in fairness, he also took some actions. He did take some actions that I, I'll show you the kind of action you will take once you're in power is going to cause a dip, will cause an increase in cronyism, and then corruption may go up, not always. Yes, he did take some action, and other countries where one can give example, including in India. Okay, the set of individuals, ordinary citizens, is that set N. Person I's joy from a corrupt act. I want people to be different. So people, the joy that person gets from a corrupt act is BI positive. Uh, positive or greater than or equal to zero. And I'll assume this is just a nomenclature as I, if I is greater than J, BI is less than uh, BJ. I'm just ruling out uh, ties. Apart from that, this is not an assumption. This is just a convention for naming them. The government currently has the capacity to investigate M individuals. So of the N individuals, government can focus on M, M individuals and check if they have indulged in a corrupt act. Yes, sir. You were saying, of course, you're infuriated by having to pay the bribe, so the joy can be negative, can't it? Uh, this is a corrupt act, though. Uh, no. And when you're choosing to do the corrupt act, I'm just taking no, a... You're talking about the, I'm talking about the harassment bribe that you're speaking of. Yes, you're yes. You're angry. Yes. You have a negative joy. Well, uh, you have to be careful. You're angry depending on what benchmark you're comparing it with. Once you're in that situation, you're giving a bribe because from there you're getting some positive utility. You're furious about the system where you have to give a bribe. Okay. So, yeah. But you're getting the driving license or whatever you're getting. Right. At that point, it's just that. You're furious, it is true. But just at that point, you do want to do it. You, yeah, you, you prefer. Okay. You wish that wasn't the case. Yeah, correct. Now, um, <laughs> A person's probability of being caught, if only M people can be, the government can shine the light on only M people, the probability of being caught is if you happen to be one of those M, M divided by N. Assuming uniform probability. I'm assuming uniform probability here, and I will have a word on non-uniform probability in a moment. And there's something interesting from that, but here it's uniform probability. Let the pain of incarceration being jailed, F. I don't want any differentiation in individuals, just to keep the algebra simple. Hence, person I will be corrupt if the joy of corruption is greater than or equal to the pain multiplied by the probability of getting that pain. That's it. Now, how many people will be corrupt? Take the inverse of the B function. Um, I, I'm using F to denote that. Then apply F to that and the T that comes out is the number of people who will be corrupt. And I'll capture that in a picture, which is all I will need now for the rest. Um, so let 
this be the job. These are individuals. And this is the satisfaction people get from joy is the wrong word from uh, corrupt act. The satisfaction they get from corrupt act, these are the people. Um, this is the cost, prob uh, cost probability of being caught. All these people will be corrupt. These people will not be corrupt. This is the number of people who are corrupt. Government comes with a political manifesto that I am going to focus the light, spend more on finding corrupt acts. And it, that means the probability of being caught goes up and your expectation is that corruption is going to go down. Now, comes the interesting question. After you come to power, and this actually, I've come to this not as an analyst at all, but just looking at the world, looking a lot at India, is in a country where you have lots of complex laws, so that virtually everyone is violating some law, you have a plethora of people you can shine the torch on and catch on any flimsy ground. And there are lots of examples. I don't have time when, when that kind of a thing happens. Then a political leader, once you've come to power, soon realizes that I've got lot, I can stick to my promise that I will investigate more. But it is in my self-interest not to investigate my friends, but to investigate people who are on the other side. I'll still investigate more. And I might catch more people as well. So what happens now, and this, since I do want to keep a little bit of six, seven minutes on other topics, let me just take you through this verbally. First of all, that's going to cause cronyism. When you're trying to fulfill this in a society where you have a huge amount of choice, all the attention goes on the opposition leaders, the media that criticizes you, the students union that goes against you. You fulfill your promise by just no longer uniformly looking at people, but looking only at one fraction. And then you can get an interesting result. Your cronies feel completely sheltered, and the others feel, feel very exposed. It depends on the elasticity. The corruption by your cronies will go up, and the corruption by others will go down. But the total could go up. So in the end, you will be landed with an equilibrium where you have cronyism, and corruption also could have grown up. That's the result. That's the paper. And the reason I wrote this also is to, in order to think about what should we do, what kinds of policies should we think of to discourage leaders, to create disincentives for leaders to follow this policy. And that took me into another area. And this is where I'm stepping beyond this. Yeah. Let me tell, get to that in a moment. I have been uh, concerned about one rather interesting thing, watching television, this is in recent times, evening news you see, there are countries which seem on the verge of erupting uh, and you feel there'll be a revolution and that'll be the end of the leader. Actually, the case where I thought that will happen was Belarus. I felt Lukashenko is going to go. There is enough protest against. Did not till now. And there are other countries, historically, you can think of, like Tunisia, um, the Jasmine Revolution. Till almost the last week, it was looking like Ben Ali is going to keep authoritarian power over the country, and he was saying that. But something happens, and it goes. It bursts open, and that person goes. I want to, to understand Belarus and what happened in Belarus, and here, again, to do with... As, uniformity and non-uniformity of justice, an idea struck me, which is nothing but, in fact, one of the first topics I had discussed with Joe, I don't know if Joe remembers this, we had talked about the surprise test paradox, uh, on which I know you have uh, uh, had a paper for sure. Um, it's the surprise test paradox has an explanation, a very, very uh, practical explanation of what dictators do, whether they do it intelligently or unwittingly to stall a crisis. And let me just explain. Take an example of a country. Belarus. Belarus has um, 1,000 people. That's the population. Apart from the leader and maybe a few cronies, ordinary citizens, 1,000. All of them want the leader to go and are ready to go out and protest. If, if even half of them go, 
out and protest, let's say that the regime is going to fall, Lukashenko is going to fall. The leader has the capacity to frighten people who are going to be out there protesting, but there's again a limitation. Only a hundred, there, there's space enough in jail for only a hundred individuals. So the leader can arrest only a hundred individuals and let us say that people are by then so angry that unless the probability of being put in jail is greater than half, you will go and do it. You will go and protest about it. Take any probability, you can then work out the numbers, the logic will go through. Uh, or say that it, it has to be certain that you'll be caught, otherwise you're willing to go out and protest. If the probability is less than one, you'll go out and protest. It looks like a hopeless situation for Lukashenko. That, how do I stop it? You, Lukashenko can stop a hundred specific individuals by saying, if you go out and protest, I will arrest you. But how do you stop a thousand people? Then something struck me, which I believe is done. You then, you break up society into groups, um, partition society, opposition leaders, category one, uh, uh, newspaper editors, category two, category three, etc. create 10 categories, uh, 10,000 people, um, or no, uh, you, you need more than that. Yeah, create 10 categories of people and make the following announcement. First of all, make the categories well known. Let that be common knowledge. These people are in group one. This is group two, group three, etc. And then announce that I'm telling my people to go out and arrest. Starting from group one, whoever's out there protesting will be arrested, put behind bars. Not If not enough of group one, go for group two. If not enough of group two, go for group three. That's the rule and the police goes out. What you will get is the logic of the surprise test paradox happening. Group one, of course, will not go out. I'm going to be arrested for sure. If this group structure is reasonably common knowledge, if it's common knowledge right now for the logic, then group two will not go out. Then group three will not go out. Suddenly the streets of Minsk go empty and you feel that people don't want to protest. But it is the surprise test paradox logic that is going through. I believe it's not always doesn't, and by the way, this logic will go through without perfect common knowledge. That's what I want to think about. Many, roughly this structure will cause a protest to get fused. And from Myanmar to uh, Belarus, there are countries where this tactic has been used to silence opposition by going through a corridor of backward induction. This is something I want to broaden because my idea, of course, is to then think in terms of prior rules that you can create, almost constitutional rules, which will prevent it's not, it's dictators. It's not, it's not, it's not Strategy has a name? Yeah. First they came for the Jews. It is. Yeah. 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 And then you silence all the way down. That's right. Yeah. So um, this is what the paper is about. Uh, can I take another two, three uh, minutes? Yeah. yeah. Then I wanted to just tell you, this is going beyond where what my current interest in is I'm working on. And this actually is to do with uh, what Moshe was talking about. You know, um, the reason I think theory is once again important is uh, some of the biggest breakthroughs in economics, in conceptual breakthroughs, took place very interestingly overlapping with the Industrial Revolution. So if you say Industrial Revolution is roughly from 1750 to 1850, Adam Smith 1776 to Leon Walras 1874, roughly a hundred year period, we begin to understand the world, but there are things that are changing and deep understanding is important. And here comes in the sort of implicit thing which has been coming up in this conference in a wonderful way, that the assumptions we write down explicitly when we do theory, invariably beyond that, and I believe it is an endless layer, there are unwritten assumptions which we carry in our heads, which are so much across the board that we don't write down those assumptions. But when the world begins to change, some of those assumptions which were, we were fine in taking that assumption for granted, we can't take it for granted anymore. Easiest example, I've written about this earlier, is that trade and exchange. We know the assumptions under which trade and exchange take place. Preferences must have certain properties, transitive, etc. Diminishing returns to scale, production function must have certain properties, etc. 
we write down those axioms, you get trade and exchange, and the first fundamental theorem of welfare economics also has assumptions. But there are many other assumptions. One of them, for instance, that people, for trade and exchange, people need to be able to talk and communicate for any trade and exchange, certainly for complex trade and exchange. But along with transitivity and diminishing returns, etc., we don't have an axiom saying can talk. We never write that down. We take it for granted. But when communication begins to change, that assumption we may need to look at. And the best example of this is geometry, Euclidean geometry. For Euclid, a flat surface, given that you're working in a small region, people are traveling over a small region, you write down axioms explicitly, one axiom, at least one axiom, you don't write down, is of a, that you're doing it all on a flat surface. Seemed harmless, till fast travel started, and that uh, axiom needed to be uh, made explicit, and you need non-Euclidean geometry. I feel a lot of deep analytical research is, has to unearth these assumptions, which assumptions, I, my own belief is it's endless. Just that some assumptions begin to get jostled and changed as the world is changing, the nature of the interaction is changing, you now need to make those explicit, and then think of laws and regulations for this newer explanation. Thank you very much.